Right. So a very warm welcome, everyone. Welcome to this Italian online taster seminar. Now, this is the fifth seminar in our seminar series. And um, I'm really delighted to be joined by two of my colleagues from Italian today. Uh, we've got Dr. Elena Poliska and Alison Montague. Um, now, my name is Sasha Stolans, and I'm the outreach officer here in the Department of Languages and Cultures at Lancaster University. Um, and uh, just a couple of words um, of housekeeping before I hand over to the speakers. If we could please ask you to um, mute your microphones and to switch off your cameras. That will just really help with the bandwidth and um, to keep the quality of the, um, of the meeting up. Um, now, um, we would love to hear all your questions and your comments. So please use the chat to ask any questions to the speakers. So if you have a look here, you have this, um, this task bar near the slides. And then if you go to show conversation, the chat will open and um, you'll be able to enter and to, to, to write all your questions and your comments. And my colleague Chris Witter um, will be reading them and collecting them and putting them to the speakers at the end of the session in the Q&A part. Um, now, we are also recording this um, seminar and um, the recording will be uploaded to um, our YouTube channel afterwards. And our YouTube channel is Languages and Cultures at Lancaster University, if you want to watch it later or share it with your friends and family. Great. So without further ado, um, I'm going to pass over to the speakers. Each speaker will talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So we'll start with um, Dr. Elena Poliska. Okay, uh, buongiorno a tutti e benvenuti. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's uh, brilliant to see so many of you here. Um, so what I'll be doing today, I will talk for about 20 minutes um, about some stereotypes um, of, uh, well, on Italian people um, in our culture. So we'll have a look at uh, pasta, uh, we'll have a look at coffee, and then something slightly more serious towards the end uh, uh, regarding hand gestures and why do Italian people talk with their hands so much. Right, okay, so uh, do Italians eat pasta? Uh, well, clearly the answer is yes, of course we do. Uh, and you'd be surprised to know that um, if you go into an Italian supermarket, you would find perhaps not all there, but you know, overall in Italy, you can find between 250 and 300 types of pasta um, available to buy. Um, early in the 90s, we had even more, about 400, and um, down to uh, market research and purposes, uh, it's been scaled down. So that gives an idea of, uh, you know, how much we love our pasta and our shapes. Um, we do eat an awful lot, uh, about uh, 25 kilos a year. And to give you an idea, uh, there are here other countries and you can see um, which ones, uh, for example, what they eat. And we're eating as much as uh, three times more than um, uh, Americans. Um, so yeah, we we, we do like it. Uh, that, that's nothing new, to be honest. Um, I've put here a little picture of uh, um, uh, pasta making. This is a picture from the, the Middle Ages, and you can see on the right the lady kneading the pasta, and uh, on the left uh, a lady putting the pasta out to dry. Uh, especially if it is homemade pasta, uh, you, you can't cook as soon as it's made, but you need to uh, let it dry uh, in the fresh air for a little bit. Um, so the history of pasta is quite a long one, um, in the sense that uh, it originated uh, not in China, as many people uh, think, uh, and this is derived from um, an Italian explorer, uh, Marco Polo, who went to China and wrote a book called Il Milione. And in that book, he made a reference to uh, having seen a tree, uh, which uh, he remind which reminded him of uh, um, the, 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 some sort of spaghetti. Uh, of course, it wasn't pasta, it was just a tree, but that's how uh, um, the myth about uh, Chinese inventing pasta. Uh, uh, there are re references uh, in Italian literature and culture uh, to pasta from the 13th century. Uh, so it's quite an old tradition, but also um, some historians have discovered that um, there were references to pasta as back as um, the very beginning of, uh, uh, you know, recorded times. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know if 
if that is, is true, but there are some um, some proofs. Um, it's very interesting to know that initially pasta was a dish for the wealthy uh, and it wasn't available for uh, poor people because it was you know, meant to be a delicacy, something enjoyed by the wealthier classes. And it was only from the 17th century onwards that it became a staple of Italian diet. Um, and this was because uh, a torchio uh, was invented and the torchio is a machine used to make pasta. Uh, this is an example of one of the first uh, machines to make pasta uh, on an industrial scale in inverted commas. So you can see the man on the left, uh, that's the man who would, do, who would be dealing de uh, needing in the dark and then and the pasta would be put in letter C, if you can see it, that's a press. Uh, and the man at letter D, it would be uh, pressing the lever so that in letter E, at the end, you would have some sort of uh, vermicelli, noodles, spaghetti uh, come out. So it was quite a laborious process um, at the beginning, which required a lot of, uh, you know, uh, physical strength. Um, uh, right. So. Truly, how obsessed are we with pasta? Are we with pasta? I would say, as an Italian, a fair amount. Okay, if you can look at the picture on the left, uh, those are all variations on uh, spaghetti, right? So, if you go to an Italian supermarket, you will find not just one type of spaghetti like you do here uh, in the UK, but a great variety. Uh, pasta, um, spaghetti alongside penne, are the most cooked uh, type of pasta, um, so both spaghetti and penne feature in the top three uh, preferred pasta uh, by Italians. And I thought I'd put here a little quote, uh, and you will find uh, all of this in the bibliography at the end, where it says, you can't just talk about spaghetti, right? There are at least three types of spaghetti, and that depends on the dimensions, on the diameter, right? There are spaghettini, and that means very small spaghetti, classic spaghetti, and bigger spaghetti. To these, we need to add capellini, which means very fine hair. Mm? And that's got to do with, uh, again, the width um, of the pasta, which are even thinner than the small spaghetti. And then we also have square spaghetti, or as we call them, spaghetti um, alla chitarra. Mm? And you can see uh, some examples on the left. Spaghetti alla chitarra, um, chitarra means guitar. Uh, and they are actually um, square in shape, as opposed to having a round diameter like uh, conventional spaghetti. So, um, and of course, I need to add here that, in fact, um, we have specific sources that go with specific pasta, and we are very peculiar about that. Uh, okay, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, again, tongue in cheek a little bit, is uh, our great, great passion for coffee. So if you look on the uh, left hand side, that's a menu of the kind of coffees you can find uh, in a cafe uh, in Trieste. So il caffè de café, the coffee place uh, of coffee places. Um, you can buy a coffee uh, in, in Italy in a place called Il Bar. So Il Bar is a type of uh, coffee house, coffee shop, whatever you want to call it here in the UK. Now, again, the history of coffee goes back a long time, but it's not as ancient as pasta. Uh, it was introduced in Italy uh, in the uh, 16th century, uh, and um, tradition goes that it was introduced uh, from uh, perhaps Tunisia or the North or North Africa. Mm -hmm. Uh, as soon as it was introduced uh, in Italy, it became uh, a culture, part of our culture. It developed straight away. And in fact, the first uh, espresso machine was created in the north of Italy uh, towards the uh, end of the 19th century. Uh, we drink coffee, of course we do, but also there are unwritten rules of coffee drinking. And this may be surprising because when you go to a bar, mm, a coffee place, you don't really ask for uh, an, es an, an espresso, you don't ask for large, small, you simply go in and ask for a café. A café is the simplest thing you can have, and that's an espresso, that's what you'll get. Now, in Italy, a lot of people will, dr will drink their coffee um, at the counter. So you order it there and you drink it there, often standing, and a lot of uh, bars will provide you with a little glass of water which you can drink before eating a uh, drink in your coffee to cleanse the palate mm? so for us coffee taste uh, the flavor is very very important um, again we don't really get sizes so if, if you ask for a cappuccino you'll get a size and that's that and if you want more 
you'll just have to order another one. Um, it's also very common to um, do a pausa cafe. So in the middle of the morning, you can just say, uh, faccio una pausa, which means I'll take a break. And that, without a doubt, will mean I'm just popping down to the local bar and I'll, uh, and I'll, and I'll get a coffee, an espresso. Um, and, uh, you know, having coffee is something that brings people together. It's got very much, you know, it's a social meaning, if I can compare perhaps to what um, drinking maybe alcohol has here in the UK. So, for example, uh, I could say, uh, well, let's go. I, I'll, offer, I'll buy you a coffee. Ti offro un caffè. Mm? Um, and that's something, you know, this is very, very, very much part of uh, um, our Italian culture. Uh, what I've got on the next slide, uh, this is what um, I was researching and I found on the internet. Um, there are just these many coffees, uh, a variation of coffees, uh, cappuccino, latte macchiato, that you can find in a bar. Now, the main drinks are like, of, of course, caffè, cappuccino, latte macchiato, but then each person have, has got their own uh, variations and preferences uh, on what type of coffee they want. So, for example, in number two, we can have a look at uh, a macchiato. A macchiato is very interesting what the word means because um, macchiato means uh, macchiare, the verb, means to mark or to stain. So if you, if you ask for a caffè macchiato, you're getting your little cup uh, for your coffee and you'll have an espresso put in and then you stain that coffee with a little bit of milk. Mm? So that means specifically coffee stained, stained coffee, which sounds horrible, but actually it's really nice. And you can ask for your coffee to be stained with cold milk, hot milk. Uh, then you can decide whether to have um, semi-skimmed milk, skimmed milk. Uh, you can ask for anything. One other interesting thing is that uh, number eight, un caffè corretto. Caffè corretto means corrected coffee. And where you can have actually um, a coffee also of course in your uh, espresso cup with some alcohol in it and usually it will be like uh, some buca or perhaps uh, some grappa uh, again if you look at number 20 cappuccino you can have it uh, chiaro which means light and you can have it scuro which means darker and that's got to do with am the amount of coffee uh, you may want to put in um, all of these you can have uh, in the normal cups uh, or as we call them al vetro if you look at number 18 al vetro means uh, in the glass okay so you can either choose to have a conventional coffee cup an espresso cup or you can ask for an espresso a coffee al vetro and some people prefer to drink it out of a, a, um, a glass uh, cup so these are you know various idiosyncrasies of uh, italian people and uh, our love for coffee the other thing I wanted to tell you a little bit about is why is it that Italian people uh, gesture, okay? Um, and, and, and we do. I mean, I can't even stop uh, in front of a screen like today uh, talking about um, and moving my hands. So again, this is a stereotype that Italian people gesticulate. Uh, it is a stereotype, but it, like every stereotype, it's got some truth, truth in it. So... What I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about, um, why do we gesticulate, if it's possible to find an answer, and how long have we been doing it? Um, there's a professor at, uh, of psychology at the University of Roma 3, uh, Professor Poggi. She has identified about 250 gestures um, that Italian people do with their hands. Um, and again, this is something quite old that perhaps um, um, dates back to Greek colonization uh, in southern Italy, when cities were very crowded, very busy, and actually to attract attention, you needed to use all aspects of your body. So just not just the voice, but also bring in your hands uh, to um, to attract attention. Uh, as you can see from the second bullet point, due to the competition and to make yourself more visible. Mm? Uh, there's an Another theory that uh, dates uh, gestures uh, back to the 14th and the, perhaps the 19th century. Um, and again, but what is interesting is that uh, even according to this theory, the gestures were developed uh, when Italy was occupied by foreign powers. So it, it's quite interesting because the, the, there's two elements. Um, the, the two elements are in common, isn't it? That first the Greeks and then perhaps French, Spaniards, Austrians. And within times of occupation, Italy, uh, whichever theory you favor, uh, they developed, Italians developed uh, gestures. Now, um, how, how did they come to be? Where do they originate? I can give you a couple of examples here. So if I show you, uh, you 
you can see the little um, picture on the right hand side at the bottom, right? There's that man mm -hmm. and he does this with his hand. Uh, so he folds his thumb uh, on the inner part of the hand and he uh, beats his chest uh, with his hand. Now, originally this had uh, a particular meaning and had to do with food that perhaps was difficult to digest and it got stuck here. Mm? Uh, very difficult to digest, it got stuck here, but as time progressed, um, this particular gesture lost its original meaning and it took on um, a more um, a wider meaning, which refers to something that, okay, I can't digest, but that it sticks here. And it, it, Usually we say it about people we cannot stand. Mm? I can't stand him. Non lo sopporto. Non lo sopporto. I can't stand him. And we just do that. Mm? Okay. Another example of um, gestures, and this is something common also to other cultures, is the raising of eyebrows. Mm? Um, and again, this is it's very interesting how it came to be because it communicates uh, unforeseen information, right? Um, and you open your eyes to catch more information. So I need to know more, I need to understand more, and therefore you need to, to tell me what it is uh, that I'm surprised about. So what you can see in this table at the bottom here is how the signals, um, the gestures originated at independent signals, uh, what their original meaning was. So the, the one, for example, about um, beating your hand on your chest. Hmm? Um, so I, I, I haven't digested, something is, is really heavy. I can't digest it, I can't bear him. And same goes for uh, the gaze when you move uh, your eyebrows. Hmm? It's come to um, if, um, represent something, you know, surprising, uh, opening your eyes to take in more information. So, and uh, um, all of these uh, gestures have been uh, reviewed by uh, the professor I told you about, I told you about, and she's put it in a, a book where she analyzes, if you can see the title of this slide, the gestionary. Uh, so it's got to do with gestures, but also part of the dictionary of Italian life. And in fact, on my next slide, what you can see is that uh, towards the end of the 1950s, uh, an Italian illustrator called Bruno Minari, sorry, Munari, um, put out a, a book called Supplemento al Dizionario Italiano. So a supplement to the Italian dictionary. <laughs> I'm already doing this, you see. Um, and where he collected a number of gestures um, and provided an explanation. So uh, what you can see in this picture, um, the man uh, doing this is expressing rage. Mm? Uh, I just want to show you a couple more gestures. Now, uh, this is probably the most iconic Italian gesture. Uh, some time ago, I, I just saw a, a picture saying that if you can do this, you are practically already fluent in Italian. Mm? And this means, what, what do you want? And it depends how quickly you move it, or how fast, uh, how, how slow, depending on how emphatic you want to be. Um, what we have here is a combination of gestures, um, more ancient gestures from um, the Neapolitan culture. And it's quite interesting to see that although these are quite ancient gestures, uh, they're still used very, very much in um, contemporary uh, Italian culture. Uh, and they are, uh, you know, everyone understands them from uh, the north of Italy uh, to the south of Italy, including our islands and so on. So, for example, the first picture you see that means money okay so you do that uh, it means money okay this is quite um, obvious the second gesture the one with the thumb stuck out um it, it means back in the past but today nowadays people you tend to have tend to use their hand a little bit more just like that um and then uh, the third one is uh, affirmation so you uh, agree with something and you go yes a lot of people do that. It looks a little bit threatening, but actually it means that we do agree with what we're hearing. Yes, like that. Oh, the fourth one, I'm a little bit uncertain because if you do that, right, which is, I think is what they're doing. If you do that, it means you, I can't quite believe it. So it may be that you're saying uh, something is stupid. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's like, what am I listening to? Um, the next one is uh, uh, saying something is very good. And it's got to do perhaps with uh, food. So people can actually do this. Or even from the other side, which is the one uh, a lot of people use. Mm? Okay. 
Uh, oh, they one, two, three, four, five. The fifth picture, no, sixth picture, has got to do with. Um, hang on a minute, wait. And we do, we don't do that, but we do a little bit more like that, a bit more sort of not as, as straight as that, but a bit more like that. Wait a minute, aspetta. Mm? Uh, then the there's the one that looks like a, a crab. I've never seen that before, but I must admit, although I'm 100% Italian. Uh, but you know, there we go. Uh, just very quickly on the last two, uh, the very last one we've seen, and you know, we are. What are you on about? What do you want? We use this, you know, to ask. It's not particularly polite, but you know. Uh, and the one which is also very common is we're doing the, the horns. They look like horns, right? But this could be quite an offensive uh, gesture. And it means that um, the person you're doing it to is being cuckolded. OK, so you probably wouldn't want to do this because it would uh, raise, um, you know, a few eyebrows um, if, if you did it for no reason whatsoever. OK, so uh, Italian people eat pasta, drink coffee and gesticulate. There's plenty more things we do, uh, but I think for now I'll stop. And what you can see is that at the end of this presentation, I've put a bibliography which has a combination of um, more um, academic um, stuff like articles that the professor has written, uh, but there's also links to uh, food, uh, types of pasta um, and the history of coffee and things like that. So a little bit of, uh, you know, a different um, sources for um, everyone. And that's me done. Uh, and I can now pass it on to my colleague Alison. Thank you for listening. Fantastic, Alina. Thank, thank you very much. So while, so while um, um, Alison is setting up, setting up um, just briefly, I've just, just talked to, to links in the links chat. In the chat. Um, um, one, one is, is um, a feedback link, so if you'd like to give us some feedback or suggest um, topics for future events. And the second one is um, one about our upcoming undergraduate open days, because in the feedback from previous um, weeks, people have um, put down that um, they would really like to learn more about our courses and how we teach at Lancaster University and what options there are. So if you are interested in hearing more about this, we've got some open days um, coming up, but the first one being at the end of June. And um, well, obviously the, the ones in June and July will be um, taking place online now. And if you have a look at the, um, at the link in the chat, then you can, um, you can find out more about this. So um, thanks very much, Elena. And um, I hear we are going to hear about um, Italian cinema now from Alison. So over to you, Alison. So my name is Alison Montague. I, I'm a teaching fellow in Italian studies and I'm going to use my 20 minutes to talk to you about a film. And it relates a little bit to lockdown because um, I'm starting from the assumption that during lockdown, in whatever shape or form, we've all had some thinking time and some time to reflect on stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to assume you're all nodding to that. Um, I'm not saying we've all got lots of spare time, but I'm sure we've been looking at the world slightly differently from before. So I'm going to help you along with that process and I'm going to give you something else to think about. So I'm going to use my 20 minutes to talk to you about a film. It's very famous. Some of you may have already heard of it, but I'm going to talk to you with the from the standpoint of giving you good reasons to watch it from a, a reflective point of view. In fact, I'll give you so much to reflect on that you'll probably need to go back and watch the film lots of times before you start to feel like you're, you know, you know it properly. Um, I'm going to supply a link to the film at the end of this presentation. Uh, it's available on YouTube in different. I found a, a particularly good version. The only problem with the version that I found is that they have, in my opinion, they've mistranslated the title because that's what Americans sometimes do, unfortunately. The title of the film is Ladri di Biciclette. I'd like you all to try saying that. I can't hear you, but I'd like you to say it. Ladri di Biciclette. Again, Ladri di biciclette. Yeah, I know it's weird talking to a screen, but that's what you have to do if you're a linguist on my courses anyway. And that translates as bicycle thieves. So as you would as you would, you know, deduce from that, the film is about a bicycle that is stolen. And it's as simple as that, really. On the surface, that's what it is. It's a story about a man whose bicycle is stolen. But the film is about the consequences of that theft and the journey that he and his son have to go through in order to go anywhere, basically. I'm not gonna tell you whether the bicycle is ever found. I'll leave you to 
to I won't I won't give you a spoiler. But um I am gonna talk about the film and its narrative because um I think that will give you a better understanding and you'll be able to watch it and appreciate it more when you watch it. Now, this film was filmed in uh, post-war Rome. So you get an idea of what Rome looked like in the late 1940s. It was devastated. There are parts of the film. There are no artificial sets in this film. Um, it's all completely genuine. Um, you can see the rubble. You can see crumbling buildings. You can see the new builds that sprung up in the in the periphery of the town centre because, you know, populations increase and there was a boom after the war. Um, but um, unemployment was a massive problem and that's one of the things that the film d deals with. So it's filmed in 1948. Uh, critics, I don't think I've ever read a negative review of this film. Critics agree that it, it has a legacy, a fascinating legacy. It's been influential, it's been inspirational to artists and especially film directors. Um, for me, a film, a film that resonated, uh, you know, that harked back to Ladri di Bicicletta for me was um, just a couple of years ago, a film came out by uh, an English film director called Ken Loach, uh, who's kind of notorious for his left wing views about things and he cares about people and the world. Um, and this particular film was called I, Daniel Blake. Um, I think it's probably available to watch on Amazon or Netflix or something but I'm actually going to suggest that if you enjoy the film that I'm talking to you about now that you then go and watch I Daniel Blake and you will notice that there are things that mirror each other and in fact Ken Loach was hugely influenced by the director of Ladri di Bicicletta so you know we can go from 1948 transport ourselves 80 years forward and find that the same things are still being talked about and are of interest to film directors because, you know, cinema is an expression of the world, isn't it? All good art, people, would, you know, critics would probably agree that if art makes you think, it's done what it set out to do. OK, so um, I will predict that when you watch the film, it doesn't matter how reserved you are or how much you think you are good at, you know, keeping your feelings bottled up. You will, if you are a human being, you will go through a whole range of emotions when you watch the film. You will feel pain, you'll feel joy, you'll feel hope, despair, you'll feel optimism, doom, anger, and you'll be grateful for the things that you have, especially if you have a family, yeah? And especially if you're a parent. I think if you are a parent, you will, there will be moments in this film that have a particular impact on you as a, as a parent. OK, and you'll also feel a lot of injustice. You'll want to change things. You'll you'll want to right all the wrongs that, that the that the film portrays. OK, so that's enough about me. I'm now going to show you in Italian because I'm not going to insult anybody's intelligence. I think that you may not you may believe that you don't know any Italian, but we're going to read this together. And I think if you just focus on some keywords some cognates there, words that look like either English or another language that you perhaps studied, I bet you will understand a good 60% of this. I'm going to read it out to you and you're going to focus on the words that you think you know the meaning of. So this is a kind of a statement about what neorealism is and what it represents. L'elemento comune che caratterizza il movimento è una forma di impegno morale per creare un mondo migliore. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. Il neorealismo è un mezzo potente per denunciare i problemi, problemi della società, eh? problemi della società e risvegliare la coscienza del pubblico, coinvolgendolo nello stesso impegno. Now, I'm not, I can't invite interaction because of the way this is being presented, but I'm guessing that you've picked up on words like moral commitment, creating a better world. Yeah, a powerful means of exposing problems in society, reawakening of, of your conscience and then inviting your public to sort of engage with that process. So that's there for you. If you want to feel particularly clever, you know, you've learned a bit about uh, we're going to learn about Italian cinema, but you've also had a bit of Italian there as well, because I'm pretty sure that you, a lot of people assume they can't understand things in the foreign language. But when they actually look for the cognates, and they do a bit of guesswork, you know, they're actually more than halfway there. OK, the film that I'm showing is, um, or the film that I'm going to ask you to watch, um, belongs to 
a class of films called neorealist films. And these are the features of neorealist films. Now, not all neorealist film directors would um, subscribe to all the theories about neorealism, but here are some things that you find, so here are some features that you find are particularly prevalent in what we now look back on as being films representative of this particular movement. A movement, by the way, that didn't last very long. It only lasted for about eight years. It kind of started towards the end of the Second World War. A lot of it is about the Second World War, but particularly the feelings in society and amongst people, humanity, you know, people have feelings, people have lives. Yeah. And and the, the kind of principle of neorealism was exactly what it says in the title, neorealismo, neorealismo. It's a new kind of realism. Yeah. But it's also, you know, declaring the fact that reality is rich. We don't need to invent stories, complicated storylines and plots to show what's going on in the world. Yeah. So here are some things that I say would uh, would be typical of a neorealist film. Lots of times they use real locations and Ladri di Biciclette absolutely subscribes to this. True to life subject matter. So things that happen in real people's lives. Uh, documentary techniques. Um, you know, the point of a documentary is to to state the obvious, isn't it? Is to talk about things that are really happening. But through through a narrative that might be fictitious, but it can revolve around a, a theme that represents social problems that people really are living through. And I mean, you know, when I've talked about neorealism with students at the university, we've said, you know, we've we've said we could have an, a modern type of neorealism where we reflect the the problems of today. You know, and my students over the years have given me fantastic uh, examples of things that they would include in a modern day neorealist film if we could ever make one. Yeah. And you never know, one day we might. Also, the other thing is that neorealist film directors totally rejected um, everything that post-war America stood for in its film industry, which was, you know, to represent a glamorous America. Everybody was beautiful. The women were all attractive and had perfect bodies. The telephones were white, everything was perfect, and films always had an, a happy ending. But of course, we know that that's not true. They knew that that wasn't true, and they didn't want to dupe their audiences into thinking that life was only ever going to get better, because it wouldn't unless we did something about it. So it, it is a lot to do with, you know, the rejection of what Hollywood stood for. But maybe that's a, a reason why neorealism didn't last that long. Uh, because it, it wasn't, you know, I suppose if you're going to be a bit kind of um, critical of it, there's not that much that's hopeful about a neorealist film unless you can find a hopeful and a hopeful answer in the ending, which I'm going to suggest is possible in the film that you're going to watch. And then another thing, and I've saved this till the last, but I think it's perhaps the most important thing um, is to do with uh, the fact that lots of neorealist films, not all, but many, and most of the ones that uh, Vittorio De Sica, who's the director of uh, La Dredi Biciclette, um, tend to use amateur actors. Yeah, they, they don't want to use trained actors because they don't think that they can show feelings in the raw. Yeah? Um, when we talk about neorealism, there are three film directors that we refer to especially. They are Roberto Rossellini, Vittorio De Sica and Lucchino Visconti, but I'm going to focus on Vittorio De Sica because he's my favourite. He's the one that I think represents neorealism in its most kind of understandable form. And he always goes down well with students. That's what he looks like. Well, that's what he looked like when he lived. Um, I think that he has a face that shows that he can be compassionate and he is on a mission to use cinema and his actors to portray things that people really, really do feel about. OK, um, right. This is what Vittorio De Sica, the director of La Dridi Biciclette, had to say about why he chose amateur actors. And by amateur, we mean that they had no formal training, no classical training. The grown ups, the stand ins, the, you know, the children, they're all they're all kind of taken from the street, literally. Yeah. So he says the man on the street, particularly if he is directed by someone who is himself an actor, can be molded at will. So basically, when you have the raw material and it's unadorned and, you know, hasn't been kind of tainted with training and things like that, you know, you can do what you want. You know, it's an open book. It's difficult, perhaps impossible for a fully trained actor <clears throat> to forget his profession. <clears throat> it's far easier to teach it. 
to hand on just the little that is needed, just what will suffice for the purpose at hand. And I think if you go, if you watch the film with that in the back of your mind, you will relate to it. You will see that there is a little boy who has no formal training, but his his emotions, everything that his face says, there is almost no need for dialogue in this film because everything, the, the facial expressions speak, speak for themselves. Um, okay, um, Vittorio De Sica, who directed the film, had a close collaboration with Cesare Zavattini, who was the screenplay writer. So he was the one who brought the ideas to the screen. So he, he's fundamental to the whole movement as well. And he also had things to say about neorealism. And quite simply, you know, he wrote some theories down and his theories are still referred to today. But of all the things that he said, I think this is the most kind of, um, what's the word, the most, the most straightforward, if you like. He said, we are now aware that reality is extremely rich. We simply had to learn how to look at it. Okay, that is it, you know, that, that is neorealism in a nutshell for a film director and a screenwriter such as him. OK, so there's no need to embellish storylines and, you know, have complicated plots and twists and turns and this and that, because real life has all those without you needing to fabricate them. Yeah. So, again, you know, we look around ourselves. We don't know what's happening to the lady over there who's pushing a pram down the road or the delivery driver there who's just taken all these Asda stuff to my next door neighbour. You know, they have their own narrative. And it might be a very interesting one. And it might be one that would translate itself very well onto a screen. OK, so as I said, the film that we're going to watch is Ladri di Biciclette. This is a picture of the poster that advertised the film when it first came out. Um, I don't really like it very much because I don't think they look like the characters. I, I would have much preferred a photograph, but no, this. OK, right, well. I'm actually crying as I watch that because I know what happens in the film and I, I cry every single time I watch it. OK, um, I've got a few minutes left. That film absolutely lends itself to just being viewed as a series of stills. You know, you could tell the narrative of this story and you could even kind of bring to life the really poignant moments even even through a series of stills. Now, to me, one of the things that comes across particularly powerfully in the film is the relationship between father and son. OK, father and son. The little boy, I think, should have been awarded an Oscar for his performance. I mean, people still talk about it. Go on YouTube, search for the actor. He's called Enzo Staiola. You will find that he's done interview after interview about his performance. I mean, in a way, I would have kind of liked him to just stay an infant because I don't I'm not particularly fond of the way that he aged because I just like him as the, as the little cute little boy that he was. However, you will probably feel by the end of the film that the little boy shows more maturity and more kind of depth of character in many ways than his father. Now, you'll notice that I'm not giving away the, the punchline or I'm not I'm trying not to tell you what happens in the end. I'm just absolutely hoping that you will want to go and watch it. Um, but as I said, lots of um, images uh, can be picked out from the film. And if you watch the film, cameo images will remain in your mind. They'll they'll be sort of chiseled out into bits of your brain. Yeah. And you will want to go back and watch it again. I promise you, possibly with somebody the next time. But the, the film moves through, you know, there's lots of juxtapositioning of different types of emotions, different types of crowd settings. Crowds are used to tremendous effect in this film because they highlight the way that the, the, the man has been alienated from society and how he's a reject. And I'm sure all of us at some points in our lives have felt exactly like that, that the world is against us. You know, well, these things are portrayed beautifully in the film, but in such a simple way. And then another thing about the film, of course, as you can see, it's black and white. You know, it's a black and white film. I've had students in my classes at university and I, I don't work from the assumption anymore that everybody has seen a black and white film. I prepare my students for watching a black and white film because some, some of my students don't don't know that they even exist. You know, they put them back into the, the previous century to which they don't belong and have got no connections with. So, you know, it's for the young people in the audience today, I would say if you've never watched a black and white film, let this be the first that you watch. You will not regret it. OK, there's a couple of scenes in the film that will 
stand out particularly. The ones that stand out particularly for me are the scene in a restaurant. Again, I won't tell you what happens, but there is a massive focus on the difference between the haves and the have nots. Yeah, it is absolutely two tables, one right next to the other. Um, but you've got on the one hand, you've got a rich family with the little boy there with his white tights on and his hair all beautifully combed back and everything and, and he doesn't say anything but his poise just it's superb in creating the difference between the backgrounds that these two families come from so for me it's got to be the restaurant scene it's got to be lots of scenes lots of little moments just seconds long where the, the relationship between father and son is um kind of the focal point of everything and how is that relationship if it is going to be the, the the way forward for them, you know, because I, I think the the um, the end of the film is an optimistic one, but it's only because the father son relationship manages to um, come back together again because it is threatened at points throughout the film. The bond between father and son is is under threat, but I think at the end the father redeems himself, but only just, yeah. There are films, as I talked about, on location shooting, you know, some of the scenes are shot in the rain. I mean, look, you know, they really, really did get wet. It's horrible. You know, you can't do lots of retakes when you haven't got a massive budget because that's another thing. You know, film directors um, of neorealist films often had to fund these films themselves or at least put their hands in their own pockets. So, you know, money wasn't a luxury like it is today. Um, so that's what's, again, raw about it. You know, there the probably weren't lots of takes. You know, it was probably, you know, we'll do one take, two takes and that'll be it. No complicating edit, complicated editing afterwards. Um, but yeah, as I said, it's all about the boy and the son for me, the boy and the father. The, the father is called um, Antonio and the little boy is called Bruno. And they really are the main characters of the film. But, you know, I've asked my students to debate whether or not they think the the little boy is the protagonist or is the father the protagonist or is it their relationship or indeed maybe it's neither of them and the protagonist is the bicycle yeah because when you watch it you will see that the bicycle takes on a meaning you know quite a profound meaning to represent it's a metaphor for lots of different things in life okay I'm not going to tell you what to think obviously but I am really interested to know what people will think um and I've supplied the film here it's on slide uh, 24 or something but you can just click on that watch the film in its entirety when you've watched the film in its entirety i'm going to suggest that you watch um a two minute um review of the film by mark commode and um, he's often on bbc reviewing films i love that man i think he's great i love everything that he says um and then also as i said earlier um the little boy bruno um, he was interviewed in 2016. Um, he, he actually still looks like he did in the film, in, in my opinion. He's still got it in the eyes. But all that innocence, all that kind of raw innocence has gone, you know. So try don't watch this until you've watched the film itself. And then to end with, I have um, I've listed a couple of other neorealist films that I would highly recommend. If you enjoy La Dri di Biciclette, you must absolutely watch Umberto Di which again is directed by De Sica. If you're up to something that's a bit more gritty and a bit more powerful and perhaps a bit more, well, more upsetting because it really does um, uh, tell the story of things that really did happen in occupied Rome, uh, you could watch Roma Città Aperta. And then if, and, and another quite depressing one is Ossessione, uh, when that's actually heralded as like the very first neorealist film. I think they're all available on YouTube. If they, you can probably buy them quite cheaply. And I think we have them also at Lancaster University Library, if you're interested in that. So I'm hoping I've left a few minutes for some questions, but that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Ciao. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alison. That was really, really interesting. I actually can't wait to watch the film tonight yeah. now. <laughs> really great. Um, so over to Chris. Chris, do we have any questions for our speakers? Hi, yep, yeah, we have a few uh, a few questions and I think we've got about 10 minutes. So um, let me just load up. Um, 
Oh, no, that's the wrong one. <laughs> that's, that one's from last week. Um, let me just save it again and that should make it come. Maybe while you're doing that, I can start asking my question because I did have one as well for Elena. Uh, so Elena, my question was about um, was about chains like Starbucks in Italy and how they sort of like how they are perceived in Italian culture and especially with these sort of like rules that coffees are a certain size and a certain way. So are they is a Starbucks in Italy like a Starbucks here or do they sort of adjust to Italian culture? Um, I would say. So I have to say that um, the chains are starting to appear, uh, not just in bigger cities, but um, also um, in, in smaller cities, if you want. Um, but the trend is that um, it tends to be the younger generation who will go and get a coffee from, um, fr from a chain. Um, Italians tend to go to independent uh, coffee places, coffee bars, because you know it's all about the taste for us uh, and the experience. And um, yeah, I mean, if you go to um, Starbucks, you'd be able to, you know, if it's an international chain, isn't it? You'd be able to uh, choose certainly your um, your size, but that's not Italian. Great, thank you. Chris, I think you might be muted. Technology is not on our side today, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not my day. Apologies. Um, Juliana was asking Elena, uh, mm -hmm. what is the preferred type of pasta in the region where you're from in Italy? That's a difficult one. Um, I think a lot of it has got to do with the regional um, specialities, the special dishes um, in, um, in in the regions. For example, I come from uh, Le Marche, which is a region in the center of Italy, just opposite Tuscany. Um, and a typical um, dish is uh, Vinci's Grassi, which is a type of uh, lasagna uh, from my region um, and you know you wouldn't eat uh, uh, that kind of food every day but you'd leave it for a more special occasion or certainly for the Sunday uh, you know when you come a lot of people come back from church and they have a special meal compared to the um, to the rest of the week uh, for the rest of the week uh, anything really yeah farfalle fusilli anything that goes but with specific sources um, that brings me on to my next question, which probably you shouldn't ask Italians while they're eating pasta in case they choke, but um, <laughs> why do Italians say, oh, PG are the best, or I don't like farfalle when all pasta tastes the same? Well, um, yeah, I can see the point there. Um, I think it's not that if you say I don't like farfalle, you don't like the taste of farfalle, because I, I could argue that up to a point, a lot of pasta, uh, especially the dried pasta that you can buy in packets, uh, may taste the same. I can give you that. But it's got to do, I think, with the type of sauce that you pair up with your pasta. Um, and you, and I know it sounds very odd, but it's how the pasta marries the sauce uh, when you chew it and when you experience the whole, um, you know, the whole mouthful uh, together. Uh, some people are not keen on certain uh, types of um, pasta, uh, not certain, not, not keen on certain shapes. I guess probably like, uh, you know, if English people drink beer, you may not be keen on certain lagers or something. Because uh, to me, I don't drink beer, but if I, you know, they, they all taste the same to me. So, you know, I think it's got to do with um, culture and personal preferences as well. Great, thank you. Um, I think Roman had a, another slightly tongue-in-cheek question, which is, are there some types of spaghetti that you can break when you cook them? <laughs> so types of spaghetti that you can break when cooking then? Uh, I am not entirely sure uh, I understand that kind of question, but I have to say that from when they are very young, even children um, try to uh, eat spaghetti uh, whole without 
them being cut. Okay, when children are really small, you can cut them for them into smaller pieces. <laughs> but uh, already very young children learn to use a fork uh, for, uh, you know, running up the spaghetti. And we actually do have a gesture for that. And it's that. Hmm? So it means, shall we go and have a spaghettata? Shall we go and have a type a plate of spaghetti? And this is, you know, uh, when you turn the fork to get uh, your spaghetti around it. Uh, so, no, I mean, Italian people would not uh, cut spaghetti. To eat. <laughs> um, we've also got a comment uh, in the in the chat from Sylvie that says um, you're also buying into into a tradition um, of grandma spending Sunday afternoons making the shapes. Absolutely, it's got to do. You know, for us, uh, staying eating is a social occasion, is bringing the family together. Uh, and absolutely, Sylvie is absolutely right, you know, is appreciating that your nonna, your grandma, has been spending, you know, the morning or even the weekend making pasta uh, just for the family, just for you, and making the sauce from scratch. And, you know, it's it's culture, it's, it's what it is. It's a social event, it's bringing people together, and it's about sharing. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got a few more. Let's uh, move over. So Roman was uh, asking whether the culture of gestures has influenced Italian sign language. Oh gosh, I don't know about that. Uh, I actually have never really thought about it. Uh, I don't know enough about, I, I know very little about sign language and I wouldn't be able to uh, to answer that, but I can look it up and certainly let Roman know. I'm, I'm sorry, I just, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know about sign language. Um, I, I had a question, which was, um, are these gestures normally quite spontaneous, like sort of? <laughs> so? I, I guess they are in a way because you just you don't think about it. You just use your hand is part of who you are. And it's actually really interesting because I was reading some uh, research about this uh, a couple of days ago. And uh, um, I mean, it's not just Italian people who use hands for their gestures. Uh, it's common throughout the world, all over Europe. But what is interesting is that, according to some research, Italian people are the ones who use the most space around them when they gesticulate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we tend to make more use of the space um, around us. Um, and I think it's just like, you know, learning when you learn your language. Uh, is, is it a tick? It's, it's part of, uh, you know, growing up. And um, it, I guess it can become like a tick, but not like a tick that you are uh, something that needs to be corrected in a way, but it's an active part of uh, a communication. And it I cannot imagine an Italian talking with their hands in their pockets. Uh, it's <laughs> almost, you know, contrary to, to our nature. It's part of our culture, of who we are, and also to emphasize what we say, to make contact with the person in front of us. So when you're in the classroom with your, your students, you say, okay, again, but with the hands this time. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yes. There's a point in my Italian classes where I'll just say, put your pens down and let's have a practice with these Italian gestures and it's really interesting because uh, for us Italians it's all very fluid you know the hands movement is very fluid um, but I've noticed that when my students uh, try that they, they don't have quite that fluidity because it's not part of their sort of linguistic training if you want um, and uh, even if we do something you know like that our you know this is our wrist is really um, you know uh, bendy when you do it but I find that foreigners tend to be a bit more, uh, you know, harsh with their movements where we are a bit more flowing and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks very much, Helen. Um, um, let's move on. Can I, I'm really sorry, but I've got to be somewhere at one o'clock. Okay. <laughs> can I just say goodbye and um, very quickly answer the quest one of those questions anyway. Um, so I'm really sorry, but I have to be somewhere at one. Um, the question is, was Italian neorealism about creating a politically radical cinema or about creating a new aesthetic or responding to a new reality? Well, I think um, in the literature that I have, um, you know, recourse to over the years in trying to get my head around what neorealism was all about and why it only lasted eight years. Um, eight years is a good length, by the way. For, for I, I say it did quite well. 
Um, I would say quite maybe a little bit simplistically that I, it was all of those things. Yeah, there was definitely something to do with political in, uh, commitment. Um, maybe not so much at the level of being able to offer any changes to the dilemmas that you know society found itself in. Um, maybe that's where it failed, but it certainly got people thinking. And my belief uh, is that any art, any kind of art, whatever shape or form it's in, if it gets you to think, it's it's achieved its aim. Um, a new aesthetic, definitely. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by aesthetic, but definitely responding to a new reality, which was, of course, the reality of um, being in a post-war in a post-war environment where, you know, you've not only you've got the reputation to deal with because, you know, Italians, uh, the uh, Italy definitely suffered as a consequence of it, you know, switching sides and not being able to make its mind up. I mean, even when I lived in Italy back in the 90s and early 2000s, when I lived in Italy back in the they were still making jokes about Mussolini. You know, so there's kind of um, maybe it's stereotypical, but there's def as Eleanor said, you know, stereotypes exist because there must be some truth in them. Um, but I mean, to bring to the, you know, to really put a, a focus on on some of the things that society had got wrong and particularly how it was failing people, you know, old people, young people, people with nowhere to live, how it was handling the unemployment crisis, how it was handling its depression. Um, so lots of those things are being um, looked at in various ways, in different ways, sometimes in a humorous way, but not usually in a humorous way, but that doesn't mean to say that you can't punctuate a serious story with, with some elements of humor. And I really am gonna to have to go now. So <laughs> thanks very much. Um, I'm gonna go now, so I'm just gonna switch off. Thank thanks you, bye-bye. Thanks, thanks. Ciao, thanks. Ciao. Thanks, Great. Um... I'm not sure if anyone else, if, if Eleanor wanted to come in, but otherwise maybe it is one o'clock, so perhaps I could hand back to you, Sasha. Yeah, perfect. So thank you very much. So thanks everyone for coming. It's been it's been great to see you all, or see you, kind of see you all. Um, you now here you can see the links again, if you would like to give us some feedback, or if you want to sign up for one of our open days, or if you want to sign up to our mailing list to stay in touch about, um, to stay informed about future events. Um, next week, at the same time, we've got um, a seminar all about translating and interpreting, where um, three of our academics will be will be giving very short presentations about um, things like machine translation and um, interpreting and what actually is translatable and what does it mean to be translatable, what is equivalence. And then, um, which will be really exciting, we will hear from three of our students, current students and former students, who either during their degrees or after their degrees have worked um, with translation and interpreting. And they will be telling us all about this. So um, please join us again next week if you can. And um, yeah, thank you very much for coming everyone. Uh, ciao. Ciao, thank you everyone.